Chapter 18, The Progressive Era, 1900 to 1916, Part 2. Progressives wanted to humanize industrial capitalism and find common ground in a society seemingly fragmented by labor conflict and mass immigration, while some desired a return to competitive marketplace of small producers, others accepted a large corporation and looked to the government to combat a growing concentration of wealth and ensure social justice. Others located freedom in a private sphere of personal fulfillment and self-expression. Nearly all progressives felt that freedom had to take on a new meaning to confront early 20th century social and economic realities. All kinds of workers complained of a loss of freedom in this period. Large auto, electrical, steel, and other companies sought greater control over work processes and found help in Frederick W. Taylor's method of scientific management, a way of increasing production and profits by scientifically studying and controlling costs and work practices. Many skilled workers saw Taylorism as an assault on their traditional control over work processes and thus a loss of freedom. Greater numbers of white-collar workers, such as salespeople, salaried professionals, corporate managers, while making higher incomes than most workers, experienced their work as a loss of freedom as they once would have owned their own businesses. These developments made industrial democracy and industrial freedom central to progressive language and demands. Many progressives, such as Louis D. Brandeis, an ally of the labor movement and President Wilson's appointee to the Supreme Court in 1916, believed that unions were necessary to give workers a role in economic decision-making over not just wages and working conditions, but also managerial decisions such as layoffs and profit distribution. Economic freedom was also the cry of American socialism, which reached its greatest influence in the progressive era. The Socialist Party, founded in 1901, united late 19th century radicals such as populists and followers of Edward Bellamy with parts of the labor movement. The party called for immediate reforms like free college, laws to improve working conditions, and it ultimately proposed democratic control over the economy through public ownership of railroads and factories. By 1912, the Socialist Party had 150,000 dues-paying members, published hundreds of newspapers and had significant support in the American Federation of Labor, and elected dozens of local officials. Socialism flourished in immigrant communities, such as among Jews in the Lower East Side in New York City and Germans in Milwaukee, and also gained support among farmers in old populous states like Oklahoma and mining regions in Idaho and Montana. Most important in spreading socialist ideas and linking socialism to American ideals of equality, self-government, and freedom was Eugene V. Debs, the former union leader jailed during the Pullman strike of 1894. For two decades, Debs toured the nation preaching that political equality and economic freedom could be won only by socialism's democratic control of the economy. Debs united the disparate and often dueling factions of the party. As socialism gained in strength in Europe, particularly in Germany, France, and Scandinavia, Debs led socialism forward in America, too. In 1912, he received 900,000 votes for president, nearly 6% of the total, and the socialist newspaper, Appeal to Reason, had the largest weekly circulation in the nation. Continued labor strife also illustrated the deep discontent of the progressive era. American Federation of Labor, AFL, membership tripled to 1.6 million between 1900 and 1904, and simultaneously its leaders became closer to corporate leaders, willing to deal with unions as a mean to stabilizing labor relations. AFL President Gompers joined with large capitalists in the National Civic Federation, which accepted workers' rights to collective bargaining in responsible unions. The National Civic Federation, the NCF, helped settle hundreds of industrial disputes and improved safety and created pensions for long-term workers, but most employers still adamantly opposed unions. The AFL mostly represented America's most privileged workers, skilled industrial and craft labor, mostly all white, male, and native-born. In 1905, unionists rejecting the AFL's exclusionist approach to form the industrial workers of the world, the IWW. The IWW was both a union and a revolutionary organization dedicated to seizing the means of production and abolishing the state, and it made solidarity its guiding principle. It sought to organize all workers excluded from the AFL, immigrant factory workers, migrant timber and agricultural workers, women, blacks, and even the Chinese. Mass strikes by immigrant workers placed workers' demand and to bargain collectively with employers at the front of the progressive reform. The strikes showed that ethnic divisions might impede labor solidarity, but that ethnic cohesiveness could be a basis of unity if strifes were organized democratically. The IWW was often called to run these strikes, which started spontaneously 
and insisted that each ethnic group have representation on strike committees. Such was the situation in 1912 in Lawrence, Massachusetts, after men, women, and child workers there went on strike against pay cuts. The IWW forged the strikers into a united group, survived militia and police attacks, and won the strike on the union's terms. Another famous strike was the 1907 New Orleans Dock Workers Strike, in which black and white workers made an uncommon cross-racial alliance to resist pay cuts and attacks on their unions. Perhaps the most famous strike was a failure, the strike by the United Mine Workers against the Rockefeller-owned Colorado Fuel and Iron Company for union recognition, wage increases, an eight-hour day, and the right to live and shop in places not owned by the company. The owners responded to the strike by evicting strikers from their houses, and after armed militias surrounded a tent colony erected by the strikers, they attacked the tent city in April 1914, killing up to 30 men, women, and children in what became known as the Ludlow Massacre. Union struggles put free speech at the center of progressive reform. Even while courts rejected the union's claims to be exercising First Amendment rights, labor struggles created the modern demands of civil liberties so critical in the 20th century. In many areas, especially company towns dominated by an employer, workers were not free to speak out without being fired or worse. The IWW in particular waged a series of free speech fights as a means for organizing unions in the West. When IWW members were arrested and jailed for speaking in public, the union would send hundreds and thousands more members to speak, forcing local governments to arrest them all. Eventually, local officials would become overwhelmed and would allow IWW members to speak. Feminism first became a widely used word in the progressive era. In 1914, a mass meeting in New York that debated the question, what is feminism, was organized by Heterodoxy, a women's club in Greenwich Village. The club was part of a new, radical bohemia, a social circle of artists, writers, and others who rejected conventional rules and practices, and its definition of feminism merged calls for the vote and greater economic opportunity with open discussions of sexuality. Before World War I, in Greenwich Village and equivalent neighborhoods in Chicago, San Francisco, and other cities, a lyrical left took shape that included discussion clubs, experimental theaters, and magazines, and which anticipated the emancipation of the human spirit from 19th century prejudices. Isadora Duncan's new expressive dance was one symbol of the era, as was New York's Armory Show in 1913, showing Cubist paintings by European artists like Pablo Picasso in America for the very first time. Freedom was central to the lyrical left's version of society, but their individualist notion of freedom was quite different from other progressives' interests in order and efficiency. Yet sexual freedom came alive in this period. Sigmund Freud lectured in America in 1909 and found that Americans were familiar with his theories of infantile sexuality, repression, and the irrational. Free sexual expression and reproductive choice became critical elements of women's liberation for many women. New sexual attitudes spread beyond Bohemia to many young, unmarried, and independent women, and the new tolerance for sexual freedom drew gay people to Greenwich Village for the first time. Women's growing presence in the labor market strengthened demands for birth control, giving political expression to changes in sexual behavior. In the 19th century, the right to control one's body meant the ability to refuse sexual advances, including those of a husband, but now it meant enjoying active sexual life without necessarily bearing, bearing children. Emma Goldman, an anarchist, regularly wrote and lectured about the right to birth control and various contraceptive devices and was arrested often. Margaret Sanger placed birth control at the center of the new feminism. By 1914, after facing censorship from the U.S. Post Office for writing about how to use birth control, she openly advertised birth control devices in her journal, The Women Rebel. She argued no woman could be free who did not control her own body and decisions about whether to become a mother. In 1916, when Sanger opened a clinic in a working-class area of Brooklyn and started giving contraceptive devices to poor Jewish and Italian women, she was jailed for a month. Labor radicals and cultural modernists, not just feminists, promoted Sanger and birth control. Even Native Americans shared the progressive impulse. The Society of American Indians, founded in 1911, was a typical reform organization, it united Indian intellectuals around discussion of Native Americans' problems and sought to arouse public awareness. It brought together Indians from many different backgrounds and created a pan-Indian public free space from white influence. Many in the society shared the basic goals of federal Indian policy, including transforming communal lands to the reservations into family farms. 
but the group's founder, Carlos Montezuma, became an avowed critic who condemned government paternalism and demanded the abolition of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. He called for self-determination and for Indians to be granted full citizenship.